Well, in a story for Farmers Weekly by Richard Rennie, following the New Zealand Agricultural and Horticulture Science Institute's conference held at Lincoln University on gene editing today, Dr David Penman was the co-chair on the Society's investigating panel as well as the keynote. He suggests that there is too much focus on the processes behind the gene engineering rather than taking an outcome-based approach to what it could deliver. And Dr. David Penman joins us now. Welcome to Serious Country, David. A big day. It has been a long day, but a very useful day. I'm sure there would have been a lot of great discussion, which we will cover off. But firstly, can you start by sharing with our audience what your top line messages were in that keynote to the audience today? Well, you mentioned one of them is looking at the regulations and how we handle gene genetic modification. It's the definition of genetic modification is not well articulated. It's different, very complex legislation across different uh, jurisdictions. We don't really know what a genetic modified human, for example, looks like, let alone plants and animals. So there's a, a definitional problem, and then there's a regulation problem that we're, we're driven, we're just constrained so much by the current um, settings. But so we're, we're, the settings are essentially, you know, it's a very precautionary. Yes, the regulations might allow um, some control release, but it's very expensive and very constraining. As I said, it's driven on what a process of genetic modification might be, rather than saying, what's the risk of things we do uh, on a product and an outcome? Are we trying to control wasps? Is that a good thing? What are the approaches to it? Uh, Are we trying to stop wilding pines? Can we do it? What are the risks? So you look at more an outcome place or because one useful thing came up was a picture around the world of all the different regulations now that are saying gene editing, which is very precise, is a sort of it's a, mo- a modification, but it's very precise. And many countries are now saying some of that doesn't need regulation. You, you shouldn't do it. And, and we're very restrictive in saying you can't do it. It's constrained. So to me, that's the main message is finding a way to have a dialogue and a discussion to allow us to look at different ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just likening it to the malaria debate with being able to genetically in- edit that. And then the, that moral um, discussion comes into it. And our regulation is becoming more and more populist focused. How do the likes of the agricultural um, you know, and horticultural scientists as a community who are so embedded in fact start to do a better PR job of this? Well, that's what we discussed quite a bit and said that 20 odd years ago we had the Genetic Modification uh, Royal Commission and, and that had came with some very quite sound uh, discussions but the implementation has not been so well done because it was a a polarised debate, that one, and the world has moved on. You know, one of the final questions was, how has the world changed in 20, 25 years? And, and my view is it's, it's changed dramatically in terms of both the technology, which is very precise, and we're a much more diverse country. Uh, we've got a lot of different viewpoints. We've got some unique attributes here. We have to do it. So it's that sort of form of discussion which we've got to find a way to do, rather than the legal Royal Commission um, polarising things. How, how do you build a community of interest that understands, yes, there are some things that are high risk, some things are not, uh, and, and maybe uh, GM free is, is no longer a, re- a realistic um, issue because we have a lot of GM products already in the country and people don't always know it. You know GM canola, soybeans, we have them in, in our food chain. So how do you build a discussion saying, well, let's get a bit more nuanced uh, and particularly to pick up different views of different communities and particularly uh, strongly now pick up Maori treaty issues become part of it. So it's a different dialogue and requires different skills. So I wouldn't call it PR, I'd say engaging uh, early in the debate rather than saying, engaging at the end of the debate. Well, the end of the debate really has happened. Uh, the, the horse has bolted with consumers in our global markets demanding a label that they can understand, which is GM-free, that's led to our regional councils here taking it on board themselves to build their provenance story around this, though, David. Uh, they have, and I think that was one of the 
difficult issues because the, the scientists never really spoke up in those council debates. They were driven from a particular viewpoint, and councillors were unable or unwilling to actually engage, my understanding is, as scientists in saying, well, actually the risk is very low. There's issues raised about liability. Well, there's no evidence that current GM products anywhere in the world have caused significant harm that would lead to liability. So there's a whole lot of barriers like that. So it's trying to get a dialogue uh, to say, well, a, a GM council thing is, is not really going to do much. It's symbolic, uh, but it's um, it's also concerning to the science community. So it's, we've got an environment now where we're trying to listen to scientists. What was COVID? Uh, we've been proactive in doing it. Uh, surely now is a chance to say we can't go on endless round and round circles about this gene editing, which is taking over the world. This is mm. a river product. But I keep saying it's not a silver bullet, but we must allow the technology to be f fully researched so we can make decisions about risk and reward. Mm. How do we engage earlier with the younger generation on this issue? Well, the younger generation to me is is the key. Uh, the, the panel I chaired and co-chaired, we took our report to uh, some school groups and they were just amazing. The young people no, this GM, GE free debate's not an issue for them. There are some big issues like climate change. And so how can gene editing influence our approach to climate change and feeding the populations a uh, healthy living? So they, they said, we want to listen to the debate. Tell us the opportunities. Give us an understanding of risks. And I'm sure that they need to lead the debate. That I have talked with some people in the... It was a 20 year ago uh, GE, anti GE movement. I said, Well, the world has moved on. The young people have got to drive this. And uh, can you find the right level of young people? You can use social media, etc., to drive the challenges. It won't be us oldies who've been around for a long time. So uh, I'm optimistic that the young people coming through understand that this is just a technology, it's a tool. And uh, any tool, uh, we've got to understand risks and benefits. So it's about phrasing the conversation and bringing an outcome-based approach. But where is the leadership on this issue? We are uh, following Saturday night's election, a Labour sole government of, who did not want to put their head above the pulpit with Greens in the last coalition on this issue because they feared they needed them to get back in. Now they don't. What do you believe may unfold? Well, I guess we don't really know, but I, I hope that they, they will begin the discussions. Before, it was just we tried to get discussions going, so we're just not going there. Yes, politicians I spoke to early on understood, but said we're constrained by political restraints. And those restraints, in theory, have been somewhat removed. So I hope that they move to have a look at the regulations. It's just the key part is looking at sensible regulations, aligning particularly with Australia, because we're going to have, soon we'll have products we can't bring into Australia because they're now allowing gene editing at a level on the agricultural products. So soon they will be banned uh, from coming into the country. It must be getting frustrating, David, when one of the Nobel Prize winners for chemistry this year were the discoverers of the CRISPR technology. Well, it was, it was fantastic to have it so, a Nobel Prize so early. It just, it's really showing this is a, a transformational technology. But equally, we don't want to be seen to being at absolute promoters of this technology above everything else. This is just yet another technology to add to our toolbox. That's a toolbox of conventional plant breeding, <clears throat> uh, which is not part of a gene modification, even though it is modifying genes. So we've got now a much more precise technology and even the Inventors of CRISPR are saying we use it with caution. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, we've got to be careful how we use it. And so far, people are being careful. Uh, and we need to have the right regulations, the right societal support, the social license uh, to do it. And we need a New Zealand social license uh, to do these things. So, therefore, engaging with communities early, not saying we as scientists know best, which is a risk in the past where scientists have done that, not very good at that, saying, well, but, and so engaging co-design of experiments, getting real evidence uh, to make decisions. So we've got to be optimistic that something will change. And I think um, this meeting today will help the process. 
in a way, wait the government's answers with interest. I was going to ask you, where to from here when you have, uh, you know, the New Zealand Agricultural and Horticultural Science, um, the scientists all in one room, there could be a lot of sort of in-talking and going around in circles, but really action out of it. Was there any? Uh, no, but it, it was more than just scientists. There were people from uh, GE free movements there as well. So it was more than just scientists talking to scientists. And scientists have very different views too, from uh, coming from an environmental perspective, a food, a, a methane, a climate change perspective. So I think we've realising the dialogue now has to be done. It's timely. All we need now is a signal from government to say, yes, we want to hear more what you do and then engage. Uh, but the form of engagement, uh, is it going to be a widespread conversation, another Royal Commission or type of thing? Uh, what? But it's, at the moment, we believe the legislation is not fit for purpose, the risks to it. Uh, so therefore, that should be the first point. Look at the regulations, the legislation, and then we'll see how we might engage populations. And... Mm. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. David Penman, following his keynote speech and, of course, co-chairing the panel there uh, at the New Zealand Agricultural and Horticultural Institutes of Scientists uh, Conference, all focusing today at Lincoln University around the topic of gene editing and the future of it for New Zealand. This is Sarah's Country.